Good morning. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you all here this morning. Hello online. It is great to have you joining us. Thank you so much for making this church part of your day-to-day -day life and being here with us. Aren't we excited that church online is joining us today? Yeah. Aren't you guys excited that they're here in the room? Yes, I thought so. You know, that's great. <laughs> um, so it's bank holiday weekend. That's exciting. Has everybody had a good bank holiday weekend? Yeah. Anybody else been extremely surprised by the fact that it was sunny? And then the world was like, no, no, let's have rain just to, is it a bank holiday without torrential downpour? I don't know, don't think so. Not in my extensive experience of being in the UK. Um, it was amazing, as Becky was saying, for us to celebrate the Queen the way that we have. I think seeing so many people from different walks of life getting excited about it in different ways. Also just seeing the different generations and how they feel about the idea of the monarchy and all that kind of thing. I find the ability to watch people participate in life at such a massive level really fascinating. Um, no, just me, no one else people watches and you're like, I'm, I'm like constantly, whenever I watch like the TikToks and all that kind of stuff that comes through, I'm always like, but what are the people saying about it? Like, how's everybody feeling about this thing that we've collectively acknowledged? Um, and ultimately, I think it's interesting that it, it comes down to one person. Imagine having that much influence across the world that millions of people take two days, four days, to uh, acknowledge the role that you've played. It's a big thing to have that kind of purpose and identity, I think. And it begs the question, in my opinion, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I on earth? Because it's not to do that, because she's doing that, and you can't have a lot of people doing that at the same time, obviously. We have a lot of similarities, the Queen and I. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Her name is Elizabeth, my middle name is Elizabeth, see, I know. Um, uh, Sarah means princess, which is kind of like queen, but slightly different. So really, if you think about it, <laughs> why not me? Except for stuff like family lines and royalty and the fact that she's 70 years older than me. Other than that, I think that you could quite possibly mistake us for one another. Now. I do find myself asking the question, what is my purpose? What am I here for? What am I doing? Especially when we watch things like we've watched over the last few days. And I wonder if you might be asking yourself the same question. Not necessarily because of the queen. I don't know why I point up here like she's on the screen. <laughs> um, not because of her, but because that's what humanity is about. I think we're constantly asking ourselves, why are we here? What are we doing? And for those of us who have faith, we believe that God has put us here for a purpose. And so we hope to hear from God about that purpose. So my question to you really today is, are you hoping to hear from God? Or can you hear God? Or have you heard God? And if you haven't, or you feel like maybe God isn't playing a role in your life, I wanna challenge that way of thinking today. Because we don't hear the audible voice of God very often anymore. So if he's not speaking to us from the heavens directly, how is he speaking to us? Now, when I was 10 and I still lived in South Africa, I came over to England for the summer, my brother and I, and we stayed with my aunt. And one of the things we did was we came to Cambridge. And I had a disposable camera, which if you are post-millennial, it's, it's a little square and it has film in it. And you take pictures and you can't undo what you've done. Just, you do it the one time. And you get 24 little pictures. And then you take it to a shop and then they throw the camera away. And they give you the pictures, regardless of the quality of the pictures. Now, I was 10, I was very excited about this camera. And we went punting and I fell in love, like, just, there's no doubt in my mind that this city was my favorite place on the planet. And so I used all 24 pictures on the river cam. <laughs> Not a single one has a whole bridge in it. And I can't even show you because my mom has said to me that we still have the pictures in a memory box. I don't believe it made its way from South Africa. I think she's lying. Sorry, mom. But, I, and, you know. Um, but all 24 of like half of the mathematical bridge or, you know, 
But I was besotted with this place. So much so that when I got home to South Africa a few weeks later, I told my Sunday school teacher and my mom that I was going to move to Cambridge to learn to be a missionary. And that was it. No arguments. Now, at the time, I was quite convinced that the calling on my life was to go to unreached people groups, build orphanages, tell them about Jesus. And so I thought the best route would be via Cambridge, you know? This is where I would be equipped to do that. And it actually became a long-standing family joke as I made decisions about my life going on through the years. How would this impact my ability to go to Cambridge to learn to be a missionary? How did this job me, help me get into, you know, that kind of direction? And we made jokes, but I knew one day I was gonna be here. Fast forward to 2014, it's September, and I've just got off a Skype call. Remember Skype? No one remembers Skype. Um, with uh, Pastor Angie Campbell. And we've just had a discussion about this potential job opportunity for me to run youth ministry at the C3 Church in Cambridge. And my mom and dad have moved back to the UK by this point, so I'm sitting on the phone with my mom, kind of in silence, as we consider the possibility that the dream of a 10-year-old is coming true 14 years later. And not only that, but by this point, my understanding of my calling has become more nuanced. It's not so much going into the unreached spaces of the world. It's about spreading the love of God and teaching young people and inspiring generations in their faith. And so this really feels like God has orchestrated something magical. Because I knew when I was 10 that I was called. And I didn't know really what it looked like. But when I moved here in January 2015 and started as the interim youth pastor, I spent a lot of time being like, how did this happen? How did I get here? And there were definitely points where I was like, I would like a voice from the sky. I would like writing on a wall. I would like a very specific instruction to move in a very specific direction, please. And I have to tell you, I don't have any testimonies about that. But what I do have is a bunch of circumstances, opportunities, hard work, steps of faith, which when I look back and recognize God being involved, I can see the tapestry of His voice through my life. So if I was waiting for the audible voice, I don't think I'd be here. I don't know where I'd be but I don't think that I would be walking in the calling that God has on my life the way that I get to right now. And so as we start to explore and continue with this series, I want you to keep this in the back of your mind. Are you hearing from God and you just haven't realized it? Now, the thing about calling is that we all want one. We all wanna feel special. We all wanna feel like we have a role to play in the world. And I don't tell you my story to elevate it above anything. Quite frankly, it's, it's a normal story. There's lots of people in this room, it's Cambridge for goodness sake, that have made a conscious decision to move here. Rosemary, our discipleship pastor, came from Chile. We all, lots of us have done this thing where we felt like this was the place that we needed to be for this season. So it's not a special story. I'm one of seven billion people functioning in life at the moment. But I know that God is involved in mine. And I know that God is involved in yours, so long as we're paying attention. And so as we look and seek for our purpose, we start to think maybe we are special, maybe there's something, maybe one day there'll be a jubilee. No, no, um, <laughs> for us. <laughs> And then the ordinary stuff in life happens and we get humbled into this like momentum of, we just do life, don't we? We're all human beings. We all forget to put the bins out, even though it's bank holiday. We all, <laughs> not that that happened to me this weekend, I, just a hypothetical situation um, that might've happened, even though I had the, the calendar and everything. But anyway, the normal stuff happens and you just feel ordinary. And then we do a series like this, who are you gonna call? Let's remember the heroes of faith, all of whom I'm a big fan of, and I think it's been a great series, and I love that I get to be a part of it. But I find myself asking, where are all the normal people? Where are the people that forget to put their bins out? Because the heroes of the Bible that we talk about 
You know, these are the people that say yes when everyone else says no. They're the people that stand up for what they believe in. They're the people that are willing to lay their lives down. And it's amazing and we should have that heart. But sometimes I find myself feeling like I am not relatable to that. I'd like to think that I would be as obedient as Samuel was if God said my name repeatedly in the middle of the night and then gave me really specific instructions. And so I actually think the Old Testament people had it a bit easier than us personally, in some ways, not always, but in some ways. So I start looking then for someone that I can connect to. And this is where we come to the story of Ruth. Now, I have loved the book of Ruth since I was very little, and I was introduced to it in a way that it was like the rom-com of the Old Testament, okay? You've got love, you've got intrigue, you've got will they, won't they, you've got a potentially dodgy character that you're like, is she gonna end up with that guy? But most importantly, and this is a little spoiler, everyone lives happily ever after. It's a good story. But it's effectively a story about a normal person that does normal things and then, you know, life happens. And so maybe the question becomes, why are we talking about her? And honestly, the more that I studied Ruth as I got older, the more I realized that it's not just one story about one girl who meets a guy and they fall happily ever in love and they live. I mean, that happens and it's great and I'm here for it because who doesn't love a romance? But there's so much more to this book. So we're gonna take some time now to have a little look at the story of Ruth, what she gets up to and how she hears from God. So the book of Ruth is set in the time of the judges. It's not a great time. And uh, and basically what that means is Israel and God are in this kind of on again, off again relationship. And God is not very happy with Israel most of the time. And at the point at the start of Ruth, in fact, there's a famine in Israel. And so this guy called Elimelech and his wife Naomi and his sons decide to go to Moab because there's nothing really for them in Israel. The sons get married to Ruth and this other chick called Orpah. The sons and the father die. And then Naomi, the mother-in-law, makes this decision to go back to Israel, which is where we kind of get to know Ruth a bit. So Ruth is not obligated at all to go home to Israel with Naomi. In fact, the best thing for her to do in the context of her life is to just go back to Moab, marry some other guy, and continue her life as a Moabite. Because the thing about the Moabites is they were known as the enemy of God. They were a heavily disliked people group when it came to Israel. They are actually cousins, but their ancestry is filled with incest and sin. And so they are very much separated from the people of God. So the fact that Ruth makes a decision to go and live in the land of Israel, commits to God, to Yahweh, who is not her God, to support her mother-in-law, Naomi, is a very unusual set of, situa- of, of decisions that she's made. And they're risky. But she does it anyway. She goes, she lives in Israel, she does her best to provide for Naomi. And because of her compassion, her kindness, her obedience, even though she's a foreigner, which is repeatedly told to us throughout the book, Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the Moabite, the narrator really wants you to understand that she is the lowest in society, that there is no favor on her when it comes to the Israelites. And yet, she persists. And as a result, she finds favor with a guy called Boaz, who just happens to be a cousin of her father-in-law. And after the harvest, he's been favorable towards her through the harvest. After the harvest, she and Boaz have got like a vibe, and Naomi convinces her to propose which in my opinion is very 2022. Um, So so end of the harvest, she goes to the threshing floor and she again puts herself in a vulnerable position where she then proposes to Boaz. Boaz is in love with her. He thinks this is great, but there's a problem. You see, when somebody dies, a a man dies and there's no one to inherit the property or the inheritance or the bits and bobs and stuff, the cousins and close further family members have the opportunity to inherit instead. They're called a redeemer. And what they can do basically is they continue the bloodline for the guy that died. It was very nice. Thing is, Boaz is not the closest relative. There's some other guy, oh, the other guy, that actually has the legal right to be able to, to do that first. So Boaz is like, don't worry, Ruth. 
I got this. And he goes and he has a conversation with the other cousin. And he says things like, congratulations on your new Moabite wife. Now all her future children will inherit your stuff. Which again is like the worst thing in the mind of Israel because it's a blending of bringing Moab into the family and that doesn't sound great. So the other cousin is like, <laughs> no thanks. Do you wanna do it? And Boaz is like, well, I guess if I must. <laughs> And so then he and Ruth get married and they have a baby and they live happily ever after. And their baby, as it happens, turns out to be the grandfather of a guy called David. And so Ruth is intertwined into this family line of royalty and no one saw that coming. But here's the thing that's really interesting about the book of Ruth. You see, not once in all four chapters does God speak. There is no active voice of Yahweh across the whole narrative. Now, as I said before, this is the time of Judges. So God has been very vocal up until this point. So then how does Ruth the Moabite, who worships the foreign gods, who's not from Israel, who is effectively surrounded by people who are grieving or potentially people who are not safe, how does she learn how to be like God, how to follow his instruction? How does she get integrated into the bloodline that leads to Jesus? And thankfully, this is someone we can relate to because we don't hear the audible voice of God either. So even though it seems like God is silent, clearly he's moving. And so it's up to Ruth to look for it. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna give you a couple of ways, practical lessons that we can learn from the way that Ruth lived her life so that we can hear God's voice the same way that she very clearly did. The first thing that Ruth did is she positioned herself. It says in Ruth 1 verse 16 to 18, Ruth replied, this is to Naomi, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her away. Our first true encounter with Ruth is one of the greatest oaths, greatest commitments that a non-Jesus person says in the Bible. She is promising her life to Naomi purely by choice. There is genuinely no obligation. The normal thing to do would be to go with her sister-in-law Orpah back to Moab and no one would judge her. If anything, people would prefer it. But instead, she makes a promise to position herself at the side of Naomi, her grieving, distraught, bitter mother-in-law. And she says, there is nothing that is gonna break this bond. Instead of choosing the people she knew, she positioned herself with people who were going to move her in the direction of God, back to Israel. She positioned herself with people who were gonna show her the ways of Yahweh. Not be perfect, because if anything, Naomi wasn't at this point. But even in Naomi's bitterness and grief, she was still moving towards God. And so Ruth wanted to go with her. So my question for you then is, who are you positioning yourself with? Who are you surrounding yourself with? the people that are doing the normal things, going about their life, making decisions that are best for them, that are rational? Or are you positioning yourself with people who are going to move you in the direction of God? Because when we position ourselves with people who are moving in the direction of God, we can't help but move with them. And then we become those people and people position themselves with us and we move them towards God. 
So Ruth might not have been able to hear God, but she positioned herself so that she could be with him. The next thing that she did was she sought out provision. So the book of, the, the chapter 22, uh, no, chapter two, apologies, there's only four, don't worry, um, of the book of Ruth is basically the harvest season. And uh, it's a really lovely story of how Ruth, by chance, chooses a field to go and work in because that's what you did when you were a widow and you were foreign and you were poor. You went and picked up leftover grain behind the harvesters. It was a very vulnerable place, it was a very dangerous place to go, but that was how society kind of looked after the less fortunate. So she happened to choose a a field that belonged to this guy Boaz, who happened to be the cousin of her father-in-law. And he happened to go and visit the field on the day that she was there. And then he happened to spot her in amongst all, see what I'm doing here? Okay, so the narrator in the book does this. And if you are an Israelite and you're reading this book, you're chuckling because everybody knows that there's no such thing as a circumstance. Coincidence. It just, ha thank you. It just happens to be right? So he uses this language throughout the book because he's trying to say, we know that this is not by chance. We know that if you add this and this and this and this and this and this together, and it becomes the people of God, then you know that that's all God. So it wasn't by chance that she went into Boaz's field. It wasn't by chance that he happened to be there that day. It wasn't by chance that he happened to see her. It wasn't by chance that the whole village had been gossiping about this Moabite woman that seemed to be very godly and compassionate and kind. And his um, foreman happened to have heard the gossip about this chick that had come in and seemed to be, you know, really lovely in spite of the fact that she was from Moab. In fact, it says in chapter two, um, uh, it says, Ruth, now Naomi, apologies, now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, um, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, I'm going to go to the fields. And she said, go ahead, my daughter. And so she went out into the field and began to glean behind the harvesters. And as it turned out, she was working in the field belonging to Boaz. And then later it says, and Boaz asked his overseers, so who's that young girl and to whom does she belong? Which by the way is not about misogyny, that is just language to understand where somebody comes from. He's actually being quite respectful. He wants to understand where Ruth's family lies. Who can he talk to? How does he know her? And the overseer replies, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. So you see, as a result of all these happenstances, circumstances, by chance moments, Ruth is provided for in a way that seems absolutely impossible. She is given favor and security when she is harvesting. Boaz says to her, stay here all through the harvest, both the barley and the wheat harvests. You don't have to go anywhere. He says, you can... Um, pick up all of the extra grain. Here's some lunch for you to take home to Naomi. He provides for her beyond measure. And his provision allows for her and Naomi to be secure in their space. And his provision comes from Ruth's willingness to position herself there. God is a providing God. And sometimes we have to not look for the obvious provision. Grain did not rain down outside their front door, but she was provided for. Now, in our day and age, oftentimes when we talk about provision, we're hoping for financial provision or for physical, material provision. And I believe that God does that. I've seen that in my life time and time again. But again, I wanna challenge you to think beyond that. Has God provided you with friends? Has God provided with support in your parenting, in your education, in your job, in your health, in your well-being? God is constantly the source of your provision. We need to open our eyes to see it. Ruth might not have heard God, but she could see him in his provision. Finally, Ruth participates. 
Ruth doesn't stand back in this story and hope that something interesting happens. She is constantly on the move. Ruth makes a decision to go and do things. And then at the end of the summer or harvest, Naomi says, now's the time. You and Boaz, it's a thing. You should go and propose to him. I don't need to tell you again how the fact that she's a Moabite makes this quite an interesting situation, but she does. She participates in this plan. And then when she goes and she has this conversation with Boaz, he says, thank you so much. I, I, I would really like to marry you, but I need to deal with this other guy. And it's a whole thing. At that point, she could go, oh, you know what? Let's just leave it as it is. Because he's not the bad guy, this other cousin. He's completely within his right to do what he wants to do. But Boaz says, no, trust me, you wait, I'll deal with it. And so again, there's this moment of obedience. She participates in this plan that somebody else has put forward. And the result of her participation is that she has a place. At the end of the story, Ruth is placed in the bloodline of David and then of Jesus. It says, through the offspring the Lord gives you by this woman, the, the people of Israel are talking to Boaz, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. And so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. And there was restoration. There was redemption. The bloodline that would lead to Jesus was strengthened by Ruth. We need to make the decision to participate in the life that God is calling us to live. We need to make the decision to choose to hear and see Him in the movement of our lives. It was a game changer, not just for Ruth, but for the way that Moab was perceived historically, reintegrated into the bloodline, the family of God. There is no one, not even the people who are identified as the enemy of God, who cannot be integrated into the family of Jesus. Why do we know that? Because of Ruth. What did Ruth do? She lived her life. We're all looking for identity and purpose, but sometimes we just need to be looking for the next step of obedience. Are you positioning yourself around people who will bring you closer to God? Are you seeing God's provision in your life in ways that you don't expect? Are you participating in the plan that He has for you? Are you taking your place in the kingdom and the family of God? Could you stand with me? We're gonna go into a time of worship again in a minute. If you enjoyed this video today, why don't you click subscribe and click on that notification bell to get a notification the next time we upload a video. And if you're new or you've been coming to the C3 Church for a little while now, why don't you find out what your next step might be in the journey of faith? Click on the next step link in the description below to find out what your next step in your journey might be.